everyone, welcome back to my channel for another video. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about my third trimester. So I'm currently 36 weeks pregnant with twins and a lot is going on right now. Um, and a lot is going on in a lot of places in the world or all over the world really. Um, right now it's April 22nd, um, the day that I'm filming this video. And of course we're in the middle of the coronavirus crisis and living in Japan has been a really interesting experience going through all of this especially being pregnant so part of this video I want to do um, a third trimester update and just let you know how I'm doing in case you are also pregnant with twins and kind of want to compare but I also want to talk a little bit about um, the current situation in Tokyo as far as how hospitals are handling the coronavirus and um, how it's affecting my birth plan because it's dramatically affecting my birth plan. So I want to talk a little bit about that and just bring some attention to the issue. So first, I think I'm going to talk about the coronavirus issue in Tokyo right now. So as of right now, again, April 22nd, um, a lot of countries in the world are in lockdown, right? There's a lot of countries in Europe that are in complete lockdown. There's a lot of states in the United States that are in a quarantine or a lockdown, some sort of modified situation there. Um, but in Japan, we are under a state of emergency, uh, but we are not in a full on lockdown. And the reason for that is that Japanese law, at least this is my understanding, is Japanese law cannot actually enforce a full on lockdown, as in um, forcing businesses to close or forcing people to stay home. They Japanese law simply cannot enforce that um, as, of, as it stands now. So under a state of emergency, this gives the power to the governors of the different prefectures to make recommendations based on the situation in each particular prefecture. And where I live in Tokyo, that is the most populated area in Japan, and we have the most cases. And I'm not sure exactly how many cases, I think we're close to 4,000 cases, Okay, so I just looked up the specific number. So right now in Tokyo Prefecture, we have 3,090 confirmed cases and 71 deaths. So relative to other places in the, the US and Europe, we are quite low as far as the amount of cases, um, but uh, there's some questions about how many people are actually being tested and whether or not that number is accurate, basically. Um, but regardless, we are not in a full lockdown. Um, if you go out to the parks, you will see families and people with kids climbing on the play structures, playing in the sandbox. Um, you see people continuing to go to work on public transportation, which is the main mode of transportation in Tokyo, is subways and above ground trains. So that is an enclosed space that many, many people are using every single day. and. Basically, you're not seeing a huge change in normal life. The only big change that we're seeing is uh, some nighttime, uh, how should I say, like nighttime businesses are closed, like karaoke parlors, a lot of bars, um, even izakaya, which is like a traditional Japanese restaurant, would be having to close around 8 p.m. And so they're just limiting hours. Uh, a lot of sports and events and things are also canceled as of now. But again, we are not in a full on lockdown. And the reason that I want to kind of describe the current situation to you is because the policies that are being upheld in hospitals, specifically maternity hospitals, are the same as those as in countries where the, they are in a complete lockdown, like where people are many, many, many people are dying every single day and people are being forced to stay at home. No one is going to work. That is a complete lockdown. We are not in that situation here. And yet hospitals are um, changing their policies to mimic those of countries that are in that type of situation. And so if you're wondering, what does that look like for me? So my hospital is the same hospital that I gave birth to my first son in. Um, it's a, actually a maternity, mainly a maternity and pediatrics hospital. So they don't even have a um, like an emergency room center for just general population. They only handle pediatrics and maternity overall. They have completely decided to deny 
any support person for any birthing uh, mother, birthing person. So that means you cannot have your doula, a family member. You also cannot have your husband or partner be there at all through the entire labor, delivery, and recovery period. The only way that they can be there is basically to drop you off at the hospital on the first floor. They cannot go up with you to the room. They cannot take your bags up there with you. Um, they can drop you off at the first floor and then when you're ready to be discharged, they can pick you up on the first floor. And this has been the case for a couple of weeks now. I think starting from April 8th is when many hospitals began to change their policy. And currently as of April 22nd today, nearly every single hospital in Tokyo is under this same policy change. The only places that are still kind of allowing partners are birth houses and clinics that facilitate um, home births and like birth houses, a birth house birth, basically. Um, and in my situation, having twins in Japan, a home birth or a birth house or a birth center birth is completely not possible. Um, in the US, you could try to get a home birth if you had twins um, and you had a supportive caregiver or a clinic to work with, but in Japan, that completely doesn't happen. You are automatically in a hospital and that is your only option. So. Um, there are many, many pregnant women right now in my same situation. Basically anyone who is due to have a baby or had a baby so far in April, and even May I would say, is facing this situation. And we don't know how long these policies are going to remain this way. And the reason I want to bring it up is because it's really a women's right issue. Um, you have examples like the state of New York where um, several hospitals in New York, they tried to enforce these types of policies where they were not allowing support people. And the governor of New York actually told them that they were not allowed to do that. He made it completely illegal for hospitals to deny a birthing mother a support person. And the World Health Organization also states that a birthing mother is entitled to having a support person there. They should never have to give birth alone. And of course, if you're giving birth in a hospital, you're not giving birth entirely alone. You will have a doctor there and an obstetrician there. You will have midwives and nurses there. But whether or not you know those nurses or whether or not you worked with that obstetrician before it really depends on your situation. So now I can talk about my situation personally is that Luckily for me, I am working with my same OB that I delivered with my first son. And so I've known her for a few years now and she's amazing. She is, I would highly recommend her to anyone. If you send me a message or something, I can recommend her to you. Um, she is so kind and so supportive during labor, at least she was with my first son. So I know that she will be this time. And I've, of course, seen her throughout my entire pregnancy this time. So there's no one else that I would trust more to be there with me during labor, besides obviously my doula, my husband, um, than my OB, that I, who I know very well now. Um, but there are many women who are not in my situation. If you had a um, situation where you were with an on-call doctor only, so you really didn't know who was going to be your doctor when you showed up. Um, and also, of course, living in Japan, if you don't speak Japanese and you're going to the hospital, um, there's going to be a language issue as well. And maybe you're going to have to fill out your own paperwork while you're in labor, and a lot of it is in Japanese. Um, you're going to have to communicate with your midwives and your doctors to try to explain how you're feeling. Um, or to make decisions at the last minute, which can happen during birth. Um, and you are the only one who can make those decisions. You have no one else around you who is able to make those decisions with you or for you or give your consent. And that is a very scary situation to be in, I think. Um, especially, you know, I can only talk for myself, but of course giving birth to twins, even though I've given birth vaginally, with no pain relief before and had a very successful birth, 
having twins is a completely different situation for me than just giving birth to one baby. So the risks of you know, going into labor naturally, attempting a vaginal delivery, and then ending up with a C-section, of course, are higher. Um, or just having a C-section in general is higher. Having complications with the delivery is higher. So, you know, there's many more things to think about. And the fact that I'm going to be there alone, having to make these decisions possibly at the last minute, is um, something that I've had to come to terms with over the last few weeks. And... A lot of how I've been able to do that is uh, probably crying a few more tears than I would have otherwise. <laughs> and of course, talking to my support team, which includes my doula, my husband, my family members, my OB who's very supportive and is very um, upset at the situation as well and frustrated with the situation. Because if you think about it, you know, it's really not your OB's responsibility to be your doula or your birth coach. They're there to make sure that the, you and the baby are healthy. That's their job. That's what they're getting paid to do. And um, because these hospitals are enforcing these policies, it's putting a lot of stress on your midwives and your nurses and your OB to um, take on a lot more of the roles that your family members, your support team would take on normally. So it's not a very good situation in Tokyo for pregnant women right now. So if you are pregnant, in Japan and you are facing the same situation um, or even if you're pregnant somewhere else and you're facing the situation of having to give birth alone. I actually wrote a blog post recently that was about uh, different ways that you can help prepare yourself to give birth alone and I'll make sure to link that blog post below in the um, comment, comment box, in the description box so that you can access it because I think a lot of the advice is advice that I got from my doula or from other members of our community here um, who are all very upset at this whole issue. And it's not just like my opinion, it's really just the, all the advice that I've received. So I think it would be very helpful for you. So definitely give that a read if you are in the same situation. And again, the reason that I'm talking about this at all is because I think that we need to make more of an issue of it. We're not hearing a lot of people talk about it. We're trying to get some of the um, local English newspapers involved to try to cover the story um, because it is a women's right issue, it is a human rights issue and um, not talking about it is exactly the way that it will happen again in any similar situation that the world could be in. So um, that's the reason that I'm talking about it now and I hope that uh, by spreading information and sharing about it that we can all kind of unite and try to keep this from happening in the future because it's just not, it's just not right. Okay, so that was a long time of me talking about coronavirus, but I also just want to talk about my third trimester and how it's been going. So again, I'm 36 weeks pregnant today, which is amazing. Um, we really, really were hoping to make it to 36 weeks because 36 weeks is the cutoff for the NICU in my hospital. If your baby was born before 36 weeks, then you would need to stay, have your baby stay in the NICU until 36 weeks. And another policy change that was really, really devastating to hear a couple weeks ago is that if you are still in the hospital, as far as um, the birthing mother, if you're still in the hospital and your baby is in the NICU, you would have 24 seven access to going to the NICU. But once you're discharged because of coronavirus, you can only go to the NICU for one hour per day. And either you or the father or your partner could go to the NICU. And one hour per day is just frankly not enough. And that whole prospect was very scary to me. So being able to make it to 36 weeks was really my goal. and. So I'll just jump into how I was kind of handling making it to 36 weeks. So I have not been put on bed rest by my doctor at all, but for the last week and a half or so since this policy change, I decided that I was going to put myself on kind of modified bed rest. So I haven't been doing much walking, mostly been staying at home, which has been actually fairly easy um, since we are mainly staying at home these days. And I've really been trying my best to take it easy. 
I'm really not doing anything strenuous. I'm not doing any exercise really at all. I just wanted these babies to stay in. So now that we've made it to 36 weeks, uh, we feel good about that and then we just hope that when they're born they will be above the weight limit which I believe is um, 2.2 or 2.3 kg. I should probably double check that but it's, it's one of those two. So we're hopeful that they'll be big enough to stay out of the NICU as well. So yeah, so physically I've been feeling actually not too bad. Um, I'm not having a lot of hip pain or rib pain like I kind of was earlier in my third trimester and in my second trimester. Those types of physical things have sort of stopped. I have still been struggling with heartburn a little bit. That is really annoying, especially at night. And But just in general, I'm very, very large and very heavy. There's a lot of pressure going down. There's a lot of weight. You know, when you're trying to roll over in bed at this point, it really feels like my belly is almost like separated from my body. Like it's because they're just so heavy. Um, they, it feels like the babies kind of move first and then I'm able to roll over. So I'm definitely ready for them to be born. I'm ready to not be pregnant anymore. I'm also not one of those people that like loves being pregnant. So uh, <laughs> being pregnant with twins is definitely a bit tough on me but at the same time you know i'm happy everything is healthy and all of that um and as far as i know they are still both head down so that's good they're in a good position um, we have had no uh, problems as of now um next up is sleep which is basically not happening at this point I would say I wake up at least every two hours in the night, which is good because it's preparing me to have a newborn again, uh, or even waking up more is what you would have with a newborn, but I have to wake up to go to the bathroom basically every two hours, and a lot of times I'll wake up, especially between like 12 and 3 a.m. if I wake up, I have a really hard time going back to sleep once I've woken up, so I tend to have to like eat a snack, do some stretching, Maybe I'm up for you know 20, 30 minutes at that time before I can fall back asleep. And that's a bit frustrating, especially when you, at least for me in my first labor, I went into labor in the middle of the night and I didn't really get much sleep at all before I went into labor. So this time I'm really hoping to go into labor if I do uh, during the day so that I could have at least had some sleep during the night. And I'm still taking the magnesium supplement every night just to kind of manage my restless legs, which I'm still experiencing that, um, but hopefully that will go away right after birth. At least that's what it happened for me last time. At about 35 weeks, I did start to see some swelling in my feet, which I didn't really have with my first pregnancy. Uh, so it's a little bit of water retention there. It was not like severe and it was not accompanied by headaches or any other signs of preeclampsia. So it's not really worrying, but I do have a little bit of swelling in my feet as of now as well. And another thing that's kind of weird is food cravings. So I didn't really have any food cravings in my first trimester that much, at least not lasting ones. But uh, in the third trimester, I've been craving kind of random things. Number one is raw carrots. Like I could eat a whole, like a big raw carrot every day. I mean, I cut it up. I don't like eat it like a rabbit, but um, every single day I probably eat one. And I did look it up and it could be a sign of iron deficiency. I did um, mess, like um, I checked with my OB and she was not so concerned, but uh, if you are having the same craving, that may, might be something to look into. And also chocolate, especially white chocolate. I've really been wanting to eat. Uh, maybe that's just every pregnant woman wants to eat chocolate. But yeah, so those are two kind of funny cravings. And overall, I'm able to just eat pretty healthily, pretty normally, um, besides the nighttime snacking is really uh, what is a bit different for me as far as my regular diet. So yeah, that's about it for my symptoms and how I'm feeling. Overall, despite the situation, I'm actually feeling quite positive. I'm just ready for my babies to be here and be healthy and to get them home. So because of all these policy changes with the hospital, I have had to make some dramatic changes to my birth plan. So originally I was committed to a vaginal birth 
And this included having the support of my doula, as well as my husband there, and of course my lovely obstetrician. Uh, but since finding out that I would not have any of my support team besides my OB there, I've had to think a little bit about how my birth plan is going to work. And I ended up coming to the, the, the decision after a lot of weighing the pros and cons, a lot of talking to my family and my OB, my doula, that a vaginal delivery with twins, even though it's still possible, is going to be a bit more stressful for me and for everyone than um, a planned c-section so it's really hard for me to admit this because i did not want to have a c-section um, and there's a lot of reasons for that i mean the recovery being one and also it's a little bit of a pride thing to be honest that every twin pregnancy it seems like ends up in a c-section as if it's automatic and I really wanted to kind of show women who are pregnant with twins that a vaginal, vaginal delivery is possible. And in, in fact, not just possible, like it's totally doable. Even actually my mom has had a vaginal delivery with twins. So I know that it's for sure possible. But I also have to realize that this situation was completely unforeseen and the fact that I'm going to be going through natural labor because I, if I am going to deliver vaginally, I'm not going to be using an epidural. Um, a natural labor in the hospital by myself with twins and a high chance of complications happening and having to make last minute decisions about C-section or uh, otherwise other sorts of interventions. All of that seemed very daunting and stressful for me without my support team there to back me up. So because of that, I needed to make a decision that was going to be the least stressful for me and also for my babies. And that decision was to schedule a planned cesarean for, for me it's May 1st, so I still have about nine days left before my um, planned C-section, which would be scheduled at 37 weeks, two days. Yeah, and if I end up going into labor naturally before that time, then I will kind of make a decision about whether or not I'm going to pursue a vaginal delivery or continue on with the C-section. But um, if the babies decide to stay in until 37 plus two, then it will be a planned C-section. And Again, that took a lot for me to come to that decision because it is basically the opposite of what my initial birth plan was, or my birth plan was the entire pregnancy, actually. So yeah, I just wanted to share that whole experience with you because if you are going through something similar or maybe you are just you know, in a situation where your birth plan is changing and you don't have a lot of control over it and why it's changing, then you know, sometimes we have to just be at peace with the fact that we're not getting the birth that we want and focus on how we can get the postpartum period that we want. And actually a lot of this advice I talk about in my blog post about preparing to give birth alone is about also preparing your postpartum support team. If you can't have a birth support team, then you can at least focus on getting a postpartum support team to help you. Um, you know, you don't want to end up with postpartum depression or breastfeeding issues or you know there's a lot of things you can really try to prepare for in postpartum even if you cannot have a lot of control over your birth experience at this point so I think that's about it for this video um, I hope that it was helpful if you're curious about the situation in Tokyo right now with coronavirus and I really hope that it's going to change soon for all the women that are due you know, in late May and June, I really hope that they are not having to go through this situation. And also just if you're pregnant with twins and you're in your third trimester, um, this is what 36 weeks might look like for you, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so lastly, I'll just show you my bump. And it's definitely big. So this is my 36 week bump with twins definitely sticks out it's not quite as round as a normal or a singleton pregnancy but that is it 
So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful for you and I'm not sure what my next one will be. I'm sure I'll talk about the birth. If you want to know more about my experience, what's happening in Tokyo and you know, get all the updates for when they're born and stuff, then definitely follow me on Instagram at MyMotherhoodTokyo. And also if you're looking for breastfeeding support, I am also a breastfeeding coach, so you can follow me at Mamaka Tokyo. And all that information will be linked below. And thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.